I'm very, very proud and excited because today is the day where we can actually show off our results. I mean, I in front of Dr. Snidely and I guess Dr. Snidely has to show the captain something at least. So, uh, let's do this. Computer, call Dr. Snidely. Oh, come on, come on. Pick up. Who is this who dares calling me during my holidays? Sir, sir, you won't believe it. We've got the prettiest, fastest race fears in the whole universe. I think it would be wise to leave the final judgment to me, don't you think? I shall be there in about ten minutes, taking the next transport. Thanks for disturbing my visit to Raisa. All right, ten minutes to go through and check everything one more time, just to be sure it's it's damn perfect. So um, here we see the, the ray trace function that is responsible for actually... Well, doing a lot of things. It's like the shader that does uh, ray tracing as well as the shading. It's a bit mixed up if you ask me, but it does the job. So what we have is three colors, the object color, the background color, and the ambient offset. The ambient offset simulates some sort of radiosity, which is cheap, but kind of works in our case. Um, what happens if we have missed, we will just show the background color, right? And um, in the second step, we if we didn't miss and hit a sphere, we basically compute the shading on the surface of the sphere. And if it's on the opposite, or basically if it's facing towards the light, then we continue. But if not, we just add the ambient color here, which simulates that kind of radiosity that is coming from the background. So if we are hit, we will set up or we will compute a ray that allows us to be shot directly towards the light. That way we can see if the light sees us or not. And if it does in fact um, see us, then we are able to say that, yeah, we obviously are not in shadow. And if we are not in shadow, we shall um, basically use the object color attenuated with the facing ratio and add the ambient offset, which has to go everywhere. And otherwise we are in shadow. So it's the background color plus an attenuated offset. So that makes sense. And this really is everything we need to make it look pretty such as this. And I must say, I love this shadow attenuation. I mean, if you if you go in there a bit, if you go go in there a bit, yeah, like that, you see, well, for a short moment, you see it. Uh, next thing, dock ops. Um, basically, the main problem was that we couldn't really control the parameters of the rendering without recompiling the entire program, which is okay as a little test thing, but it was also kind of annoying all the time. So what to do? Uh, as quick and easy as possible. I tried to parse environment very uh, parse environment variables. I tried to parse arguments myself and realized that I'm actually unable to do it because, yeah, it was strange. Um, too much for me, I guess. Uh, dealing with OS strings is a bit difficult. So I chose doc ops. Look at that. Doc ops basically allows you to put your user's description in plain text into your into your code and then in this case a compile time macro is analyzing and parsing this to spit out everything you need to actually parse this into a structure the structure is generated on the fly for you and um, not only that as you can see flag samples per pixel flag height flag width i can even specify the type of argument so it will try to convert whatever is given there automatically and if anything like that fails, uh, the argument parsing will fail and my program won't even get anywhere. So that's super amazing, thrilling. So here's the part where it actually parses this, arg, stock op, decode, unwrap or else. Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a lot. I just copied this, I must admit. Probably makes sense. Um, so here that's your argument structure, which is the final parsed version of it. So let's see how it looks like, shall we? Yes, there it is. As you can see, everything is parsed nicely into a custom struct that can be used right away. I mean, there's nothing more to say about that. Awesome and works as advertised. Now that we are at it, we should probably make our trace procs next to the environment variable also a flag. It's super easy. Just add a flag with the respective name and type so that the type conversion will be handled for you. And finally, add the correct logic so that um, the environment variable overrides the command. Oh wait, it's actually the command that should override the environment variable.
Looks pretty good. It's completely self-documenting now. Awesome. Next, we should definitely look at the competition. I mean, after all, the whole thing is half the fun of, you know, we have advantages due to changes in algorithm. So first things first, previously the CP pork was uh, calculating in doubles and now it's just changed to floats. So there's no performance loss. Next thing, instead of a list of scene pointers, it's a vector of scene pointers now, which is faster to iterate and it's pre-located too. And last but not least, the intersect signature has been adjusted to be exactly as the one that the restations use. And a few functions and methods have been declared in line. Maybe that helps, maybe not. I think that helped a little bit. Finally, the Gopher version. Actually, there was there was less to do in a way because it was you know what what can you do except for arranging the signatures to to work like ours. So there's the intersect call again that now manipulates uh, the actual hit structure in place, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it here. Not much to do. Well, kind of shows as well because the the Gopher version is the slowest, but there will be more about that later. Later in the sense of right now. So that's the CPP version. Uh, it's 0 0.462 seconds for a simple 1024 squared image and one sample. So that's kind of the default here. And next, the Rustation version is 0.42. Yes, we are actually faster than CPP in that particular case. I mean, we are much faster in setting up the scene. You have to think of about 20,000 fears that are created there, as well as 5,000 groups that contain all of these. And that takes, takes time if it's completely heap located every single sphere, which simply is not the case for us, right? We just have 5,000 allocs, after all, whereas CPP has like hundreds of thousands. Things look different though, in the moment the samples are cranked up because then the relative time it takes to set up the scene is much uh, lower than uh, the overall rendering time. So let's do the same thing and um, maybe we do the same thing with actually setting up the timer. Mm -hmm. Well that seemed like 5.8 seconds to me, that's just my feeling. I don't know, let's wait for the actual timer run here. And there we go. 5.865 seconds. So we are, no, that's not the one. That one is the one, right. Good one, good boy. So here we go. We are a tad slower, right? A tad slower. And I think that's only getting worse the longer the rendering time becomes. But yeah, I don't know why actually, because C++ should be more, I mean, more wasteful, right? It's virtual function calls everywhere. Uh, it's pointer accesses everywhere. We don't have that. We don't have that to that extent because we are much more kind of confined to pre-allocated memory structures there. Anyhow, let's have a look at the Gopher version. It's quite interesting to see that it's far away from anything else. It's 1.2 seconds. Why is that? I have no idea and I would like that to be faster because Gopher programs, after all, they are very fast, no doubt about it. SHA-1 performance versus Rustation SHA-1 performance kind of shows shows what I'm talking about here. But they do have an ace up their sleeves because there is multi-threading. So go max procs, let's go for A tier, all the physical and logical cores accelerate the processing quite a bit. 0.26 seconds, now they took the lead. They took the lead, but I know that we can do the same thing. So let's go multi-core here. Num cores is eight. You can do it, come on, come on. So what was that? One point, oh yeah, too many, too many samples here. So let's go to one sample again, and there we go. 0 0.134 seconds. So still twice, twice as fast in that particular case. But maybe, and for some reason, it's just faster setting up the scene because after all, uh, we only use 532, I mean, basically 5.3 cores effectively, even though that should be close to 800%, it's just 532%. So I guess that is totally related to it. Let's see, if we crank up the samples, um, things look quite different. As we are now quite a bit faster, more than two times. Uh, that's more, that's more like it, I suppose. 
introducing me, Dr. Snidely. So, assistant, I'd like to have a coffee. Why, where's my coffee? You should bring me a coffee ten minutes ago. Gee, ah, just a few seconds away here and all of a sudden everything goes wrong. So, where's the result? Show me the race fears. Show them to me now. Oh, of course, here's your coffee and here are the race fears. Ugly. Of the competition. On the left side you have the CP pork version, uh, grayscale black and white and not much to it. On the right side you have a little more shading in poison green. It's quite some chic. And that's the gorgeousness of the Rustation Empire. Look at this attenuated shading in the shadow areas and of course the nice rusty atmosphere there, the background, the radiosity simulation all built in and as if there wasn't enough we are the fastest in the universe. Great work, as it could have only been achieved by an assistant trained by the mysterious and incredible Dr. Snidely. The captain will be very pleased. Did anyone call the captain? Here I am in all my gloriousness and look at my work. It's amazing. The most beautiful and the fastest race fears. I just called my superiors and they're very pleased with my work. Thanks for nothing guys and uh, have a good day.